good afternoon. It's a joy to have you here with us at St. Dominic's, the, also the diocesan shrine of the Rosary. And what I want to share today with you a few reflections on is the heart of Mary. Mary is very often presented with her heart. And the heart tells us a lot about Our Lady. In modern culture, we associate the heart mainly with emotion, with romantic love, sometimes mere sentiment. We're probably used to sending little sets of hearts to each other with tweets and texts. It's a very common symbol then. And indeed, it was a very common symbol in the Bible and in Jewish thought. When the Jews, when the sacred writers talked about humanity, when they described an aspect of humanity, heart was the word they used above all others and more commonly. But their understanding of heart was different or fuller than that modern one which I have described. For the Jews, as indeed for other ancient peoples, the heart was not just associated with the emotions, but with thinking, with knowing, with willing and desiring. It's a little bit like we think of the brain nowadays. The heart then was the center of the person, the physical organ through which the soul worked in a preeminent way, helping us to know and think and choose. And that's why the Lord commands the Jews to love the Lord their God with all their heart. <clears throat> that's why they're told to think with their heart, to desire with their heart. And when we think of the heart of Mary, therefore, we should think of all these things. Mary is an intelligent woman. Mary is a woman with a full emotional life. Mary is a woman of strong will, of moral character and great courage. And all these are expressed in her heart. We read twice in the New Testament about the heart of Mary in explicit terms. When the shepherds have visited her and given her the message from the angel, given them an account of their vision, it says that she kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. That means she remembered them, she treasured them, it also means she turned them over. In the Old Testament, they use that word to ponder when it comes to considering puzzles and riddles, especially puzzles and riddles from the Lord. Because the Lord does not always speak to us uh, directly or explicitly. He sometimes gives us something to think over, meditate upon, chew over that we may discover its riches. And Mary embodies that practice. She chews over and deepens her understanding of the words of the Lord. And the second time we have that phrase is after Jesus has gone missing in the temple. It causes his mother great distress. The word that's used to describe that distress is the same word that's used to describe the distress of the mother of the seven Maccabean brothers who are tortured to death in her presence. She's distressed. Why have you done this to me, us, she says. And Jesus says, did you not know I must be in my father's house? And Luke says, they did not understand. But 
she kept these things in her heart. She pondered them so that she would understand. So that she would understand, as Jesus hints, that the will of God comes first before even family ties. That doing the will of God will separate him physically from his mother. That doing the will of God will cause her suffering. It's a pattern that repeats itself in a magnified way in the public ministry. But Jesus, in that incident, prepares her for that through what he does and then through his words and then by her pondering them and growing in maturity and, if you like, letting him go, supporting him in doing the will of God even though it will bring both of them suffering. For the heart of Mary expresses that Mary is a woman of faith, hope and love. Yes, she is immaculately conceived, and yes, she is full of grace. That means her will is strong and not confused by disordered desires in her flesh. It means her mind has a clarity, but she still walks by faith. She still needs the revelation of God to show her the plan about Jesus. And God even then still asks her to ponder it, to grow in full understanding. It's quite telling that, yes, the angel Gabriel appears to her at the Annunciation and she receives knowledge about Jesus. Special, unique knowledge. But that's the only time in those early years that we're told that she received something directly. After that, it's Joseph that hears. After that, it's Simeon who hears, and between the shepherds who hear, the messages are passed on to her. She walks by faith, and in that she is a model to all of us. She is taking to heart, in a fuller way, the word of God. She has taken it to heart in her upbringing. We know that from the words and the knowledge she has at the Annunciation. We know that even more fully when she proclaims her Magnificat. Here's a hint if you ever do an exam on Scripture or the Old Testament or especially the Psalms. If someone was to ask you to summarize the Psalms in a few lines, you couldn't do much better than read out the Magnificat. She understands in a crystallized way the heart of God's revelation. And that prepares her to understand the place of Jesus in it. But it's a journey, as I say, of faith. It's a journey in which she dares to ask the Lord questions. She asks the angel, how can she conceive without violating the principles of morality, without violating her commitment to the Lord? She dares to ask or to say to Jesus, why have you done this to us? And in this she tells us that we are allowed to ask questions of the Lord with respect, with a desire to grow, with commitment. But yes, we should ask the Lord questions that we may grow in our faith, grow in our understanding. But especially then, grow in doing the will of God. There's an incident in the public life of Jesus where a woman says, blessed is the woman who gave you birth and the breasts who sucked you, suckled you. And Jesus says, referring to his mother, blessed rather is she who keeps the word of God and does it. Because Mary's knowledge of the Lord was never just theoretical. She always put it into practice because, as she says at her Annunciation, 
Behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your will. She actively puts it into practice every minute, every second of her life. Hers, then, is a way of faith, but it's a way of suffering. Yes, she's immaculate, which means she's protected, but she's not ever protected from suffering. The very act of agreeing to be the mother of the Lord risks her marriage, risks her being put out, risks her being accused of adultery, and there were serious consequences for that. She trusts the Lord. She gives birth to the Lord in poverty. She has to flee for her life to protect his as a refugee. All this prepares her for the public life of Jesus, the life in which he will be the suffering servant. I often wonder what her feelings were when Jesus came to Nazareth and is rejected. When the village in which she grew up, in which he grew up, turns its back on him and indeed tries to throw him off the cliff. She, he walked away. She had to stay and endure the gossip, the comments, the nastiness. But all this prepares her for that climactic moment at the foot of the cross, when she accepts the will of God, not just accepts it, but sees that Jesus, in what he's doing, is redeeming the world. She has faith, she has acceptance, she has confidence. Jesus had proclaimed publicly that he would suffer and die and rise again. She has faith in those promises. She has faith when she sees the notice that he is the king of the Jews, put there to shame him, that he is fulfilling the promise made by the angel Gabriel at the Annunciation, that he will be the king of Israel forever. As he, in those hours, defeats sin, defeats Satan, defeats death, and shows himself to be the king of Israel, she, having walked that way of faith, schooled in growing in understanding, schooled in suffering, becomes the queen in that kingdom and mother of all souls. As he is crowned in his resurrection and ascension, she is already acting as the Queen Mother at the center of the church. We turn to her for her prayers, but we also turn to her to know how to live. Because the heart of Mary shows us that she is a person who walked the way of faith, hope, and love perfectly. She used her mind, and therefore we should use her mind. She brought her emotions into play and put them at the service of the Lord, and so should we. She was willing to suffer and yet continue to have faith and hope, and she opened her heart to all. Brothers and sisters, let us look to the heart of Mary as the expression of her discipleship, and look to her heart as the most perfect way that we can learn to follow her Lord and Saviour Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. In this, and as we consider the feast tomorrow of Christ the King, may we be worthy members of his kingdom. May we learn to rule with Christ by his power at work in us, so that we can share fully in that kingdom in which he is king, and under him, and serving him and loving him, Our Lady is Queen.